Welcome to Our Independency TV. I'm Gal Sinclair. And I'm Natasha Nunez Sinclair. This week, we share the story of a man who has spent most of his life using substances and living on the street. Joining us to discuss this are uh, Mr. Michael Andre, who is 19 years in recovery and also the outreach coordinator of Rebirth House, and Mr. Roger Watson, who is the manager for the Center for Socially Displaced Individuals, or we know it as uh, Riverside Plaza. The center is now home to a man who is living his life in recovery and has turned his life around. Let's take the journey now with Michael Ford. I grew up in the ghettos, in Roses, Cleveland, the ghettos, where it mostly have poor people. And something strange about that kind of environment, everybody seems to be happy. Happy in the sense, who is smoking, drinking. And that is their world. They seem to be happy in that world. I am the second in about 13 children. I went to school in San Fernando. And after a period of time, I ended up in Williams and Hardbargain, where I also went to school, sit common entrance and what's not. And then I come back to San Fernando, end up going to college, for some reason, my father locked me out at night. And I had thought that he wasn't right to lock me out because I was right across the road from where we lived. And he saw me there. So when I went and knocked on the door and he told me, go back where I come out, I find he abuses power because I was right across the road. So I never go back home from that age. That was about 14, 14 going on 15. I never go back home. And I, from that time, learned the street life. Forget education, forget everything, and learn the street life. Gentlemen, Michael, uh, Mr. Ford grew up mm -hmm. in what we call the ghetto. Roger, how can an environment influence persons growing up? Well, what I will say there is, is, is naturally what's going on within the environment, in, in the ghetto, because this is what in front of me, this is what I'm learning. Michael mentioned of everybody smoking and drinking and be happy because drinking and smoking may tend to hide the individual problems. Mm -hmm. But as I will say, when the high gone, the problem is still there. But then again, somebody can grow up in the ghetto and still make themselves something, whether it's a doctor or lawyer. So it's all based on your mind frame, you know, and where are you going? Normally, somebody in the ghetto may tell you, come and try it, come and take a smoke. As well as you might go to ease a frustration, as well as you might take it to be inquisitive and never know the dangers of the substance, how addicted it could be. Right, but in general, the community has a lot to do with the upcoming of children, childhood, a lot, a lot. And a lot of people need to realize that the community just can't say, well, some community naturally encourage the youths because you saying something at your home, as he say, his father, try to discipline him there because normally as a 14, 15 year old, he may want to have his own way, mm -hmm. right? Though it's not saying he don't like his father, he don't like being home, all these sort of different things, but the rules his father is putting down at the home there, he want to be home like his father, and also do the things that he wanted to do outside, which his father is showing him and not tolerated, because in the long run, that is his son. He wants something good out of his son. Right. So, so Michael, have you f found over the years of, of your interaction with addicts that young persons, especially in, in Michael's case, where he was sort of abandoned by his family, his father told him, you know, I don't want you in this house anymore. Um, how, how much of that is a common story 
in the lives of addicts. Well, yeah, we get a lot, lot of addicts saying that, but then it's what is the cause of them putting you out? Mm. They have to have done something wrong. Right. But they're just like that, right? Right. So maybe they just, maybe I started to smoke cigarettes or use alcohol at an early age. I wonder if one of the reasons he was, he was put out of the home. So you think that it was more in the motor than the pastel? Well, yeah, yeah, it was more than that. Because the environment he grew up, I know that area very well. Mm. And anywhere to turn to smoke or drink, as he, as he rightfully said. Right. Yeah, there were um, about eight buildings, eight to ten buildings in that area. Mm -hmm. And each building had two or three pushermen. Some selling marijuana, some selling cocaine. Right. So he grew up between the drugs. So maybe that's one of the factors that caused the father to put him out. And, and grew up clearly self-sufficient because as a 14 or 15 year old being put out on the street and having to make your way at that age yeah, to survive and out there, yes. of course that, that's not something easy for yeah. a teenager to do and some people use the drugs as a coping mechanism, yeah, mechanism yeah. to stay to live on the street not easy to live on the street no certainly because not you may sleeping out in the dew sleeping on a park bench or on a, on a pavement or something mm. I need to be high to do that most times We'll take a break, and when we come back, you'll hear more of Michael's story. Well, let's now continue the story of Michael Ford. I was introduced to marijuana, which seems to be good, because everybody's smoking, we're smoking, drinking. And I start to smoke... And after a period of time, I start to sell it. So I end up smoking it and selling it. And at that point, I realized that me am going to work because I come like I'm making that my work. So I'm handling money without rubbing a one, without begging a one. And according to how I have it done from that time, I seem to be enjoying it because I'm getting high, so everything seems to be good. I get close to someone who have an apartment and get in the apartment. So I live in the apartment, but how I get in contact with this person, them love the weed and them love the, how I'm doing business. So I get in, in this apartment because I'm my ambition, because that person loves weed and love how I could sell weed and control weed. So I end up living in an apartment and selling weed. And the business seems to be going so very good to me in that time that the business get bigger and I start selling from joints to 10 piece to 20 piece to ounce to pound, you know? Because what is strange about all that time I pass and try can remember my family really looking for me and saying, but wait now, how you ain't coming home, you understand me? I can't remember nobody looking for me and saying, why you don't come back home? Now, Michael, I want to ask you about the last thing that we heard from Mr. Ford. He said that he, he expected to get a call or some contact from his family, despite the choice that he had made, as we heard earlier, to leave home. Why do you think he was still longing for some kind of support from his family? <laughs> well, he made his choice, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the family probably was hurt too, that, mm -hmm. that he made that kind of choice to leave home. Mm -hmm. As they probably know about the lifestyle he was living. Right. They probably didn't have to ask him to come back home. You know, bring that back into the home also. So they, were, they didn't want that. So I don't think they would have accommodated him once he lived in that lifestyle. True. Yeah, because he found that income and he was satisfied that he make, he he make more money than if he was working. So he was good with that. Right. I think if he wanted ready to go home, he wants to pick up himself and go back home and ask him. You know, tell him he's sorry that he leave and all mm -hmm. that, you know, and make some kind of compensation with him. True. Because he did say that he was following his ambition to yeah. be successful. So you would think that. Although it's, it was an illegal activity, he was yeah, successful at it. You know? He was making money, so he said, it's a, that's a success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if he really wanted to go back home, if he wanted that family love then, he should have gone back on his own. Now, Roger, uh, what about enabling? Because we heard how he was so happy to find this person 
this apartment that the person being a smoker themselves, he has the supply. Mm -hmm. um, is it a common thing in, in, in those areas, um, you know, where people enable each other to do the, the negative stuff sometimes? Yeah, well, first of all, how, how I will highlight that is that Michael is 14, 15, he young, he's inexperienced. Mm -hmm. So he could be easily be led astray, not knowing I'm going in the wrong direction. He might even see my father was trying to put me on the right track and put to, to protect me from others. They opened their hands to him because he's selling marijuana. Not only that they'll be getting marijuana to smoke, but the marijuana making money. Yeah. So it is a living because, I mean, I say, any ghetto things are hard. Right? Uh, we can't just look down at the ghetto people and say, well, what's going on? But some of them, they do these things and naturally survive because they might come out, try to get a job, nothing doing. Nothing yet, true. So it, it, they look at it as a way of life. So Michael has been successful at selling marijuana, but now let's hear how he was introduced to crack cocaine. The business seems to be so very profitable and I seem to be so enjoying that life. That I just did and thing going on. How do you say it in street language? I build a block. I leave from a short street and going up on the coffee and things going good, people come looking for me and the business seems to be going very good. I was handling a lot of weed at that time. I remember having this weed, it's a problem to hide weed in that time. And I find places to hide weed and everything seems to be secure. But somehow I lost some weed. I lost a lot of weed, about 50 pounds or so. And it never really troubled me to the extent because I always handling weed. But in passing through the ghettos, I met this young man. And because people have always talked about he does know everything that will be happening in the town, I was telling him, I said, but I lost some weed the other day, boy. Do you know anything about it? And he's telling me, boy, Mikey, boy, it's God sent you, come to the right man. I know everything about it. Not do I know everything about it. You will also get it back. But I was so happy to hear what he telling me. That I waited him and he said, let us walk. And he took me on a journey. And on the journey, he will always tell me, let me see how Andre did. And I, thinking about the objective I'm going to get what I lost, it was no problem to give my hundred. And he had been taking my money until the money reached a thousand. But when he take this money, he used to run in a hole, street language, run in a hole, and buy a, buy a, 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 a straw, cooking straw, and cook it, and make it a rock and smoke it. I not studying here, I just always want them to finish that quick, and then we go out on the journey. But when, he, when it reached a thousand, and he asked me for the next hundred. I was saying, wait, wait, wait. You bring me on a journey here to get what I lost. And you already taken my money. I can't understand that. I can't give you no more money, you know. What about the thing you bring me for? And then he said, what thing you talking about, boy? That had me so shocked. But I laughed, and I leave the company. And in leaving the company, I started to study wait now. Is that that's how cooking does change people well? I had to try it. And you know it's true? One smoke is too much and a thousand is not enough. Now Roger, we, we heard how Michael said he was introduced to cocaine. He saw another person being subjected to the ravages of the drug. And his quotes one smoke is too much and a thousand is not enough. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between marijuana and cocaine in terms of how addictive it can be and how it affects the body? Mm. Um, based on the question you asked me there, I will just start it in a different tone. Um, Michael was being taken advantage of there, first of all. 
the person realize, well, the same thing I say, you come outside there, you're young, you're inexperienced, mm -hmm. and this is what anybody could be subject to. Subject to. In terms of, I naturally taking your hundred dollars, going, 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 going. And again, Michael didn't see the dangers of what it is going on. He just looking back for the weed. He just looking back for the money he making and all mm -hmm. these other different things and the enjoyment that going on there for the while with him. Mm -hmm. But when this guy started taking his money and he started giving the guy a hundred dollars over and over, he was being taken advantage of because not everybody the guy could really do that, do that with. with mm -hmm. You know? So just for weed, just for money, look how somebody could cry. Eh? Mm. Because you're smoking weed. A lot of people think weed is a, a, a relaxation. Although you could get addicted to weed also, which means a lot of people get addicted to weed, but the cocaine is a more of an addicted substance. The weed will be more dangerous in terms of staining your system, naturally affect your brain, mm -hmm. send you with mentally ill problems, but the cocaine could also do that. Uh, it all depends on how much you use and the period of time you use it for. Yeah. So don't feel that the weed could do this and the cocaine can't do it. Both of them could do damages. How would he have known, apart from observing what was going on around him, I'm sure he would have seen pipers in his community when he was growing up, but he didn't realize that he would become susceptible to that, to that drug. Roger. Yeah. Well, he seen he didn't take it serious. Probably that's what I will say. He didn't take it serious because you're in the ghetto. You're naturally seeing people buying cocaine and smoking as well too, but he not concentrating on it. Mm. Because even the guy a hundred, a hundred, a hundred, a hundred, that is just to show how craven people is go behind cocaine. They will do almost anything. Yeah. Take advantage of whoever it is. Imagine take advantage of Michael alone. Because people reach the extreme with cocaine, they will use their own wine, their own churan, all sorts of different things to get a next fix. Yep. Let's hear now about how Michael's life changed once he became addicted to cocaine and he became homeless. Living that life, you know the money will run down, you know your ambition is going to run down, and in it running down, I get my own, my own uh, apparatus. I uh, stopped doing the uh, marijuana business like how I used to do it. The business started to drop. Everything started to drop. Your dressing started to drop. Your hygiene started to drop. Everything dropping. Everything drop. It dropped so low that I end up sleeping on the pavement. And I used to be on the pavement and saying, oh, wait, 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 oh, how I reach here, boy? I couldn't even understand how I reach here. Somehow or the police doesn't know what's going on. So you find it would reach a time that the police, when they see you, they wouldn't pass you straight. They would stop you and search you and see whatever you have. You understand? And within them fears, I want to believe they get me with the charge called in possession. It about two or three rocks at different occasions. So I have been in and out of prison about five or six times. There's nothing to be proud of, but it's, it's my life story, so it's real. About five to six times. So smoking become part of my life and going to prison become part of my life. You know, so nothing was strange to that. Living, in, living nowhere become part of my life. When your clothes dirty, you know to go in the Salvation Army. And for some reason, the Salvation people like they get a like me. Because they're selling a pants for a dollar and a shirt for a dollar. But they ain't selling me nothing. Because me have no money to buy nothing. When I go in the Salvation Army, they say, so what you want? I say a shirt and a pants, they give me a shirt and a pants. So I have been living to bed. To bed, I will always get in the market. You know, I just study that now. That pipe loose, so I don't know how I used to fit under that pipe. You understand? I'll get in the market, get a dipper. You have to know the timing to go in the market when the police will be making the round. 
and I'll get a bath. So I always used to bathe and change my clothes. I never used to wait till my clothes get dirty and you know. When the night come, I'll get a piece of cardboard and sleep on the pavement. And I lived that life. So long I lived that life, you know. I don't know. I used to be uncomfortable, right? but I settled for that life. I used to be uncomfortable, but I settled for that life. Sleeping on the streets, what I realized, they also I get to realize, is not only people that use drugs on the streets. It's had a mental man, it's had a, a person who have some kind of problem, whatever the problem is, you know. A lot of different characters on the, the street. It have people who using cocaine, it have people who using alcohol. A lot of them use beer rum, you know. At the time I take a taste of beer rum, I say, but wait, this is my people. I never like the taste. I never, never like the taste. So I never fall off the beer rum. But I stick with the cocaine, I stick with the cocaine, I stick with I stick to the cocaine so much that I stop using weed. Maybe because I couldn't afford it again. So I just smoking cocaine with tobacco. I, I, I stop using the pipe now. I start to use black cigarette. Cocaine with tobacco, cocaine with tobacco, cocaine with tobacco. I get held so many times. Michael, one person could try cocaine and don't want it again, but then there's it. There are those who will try it and get hooked for a very long time. What's the difference with the personality? Is all, does it doesn't have anything to do with personality at all. Yes, it does have the character and the personality, yes. But even from small, you look at a person playing. Mm -hmm. As you say, you can identify that it's flying a kite, mm -hmm. right? Night comes, you're still flying the kite. You can't see the kite, but it's still flying. Right. All that is from our addiction, right? So there are persons who could use in moderation also. There are persons who could take one smoke or one drink and don't want any more, right? But there are those who, when they take the first one, they go back to the first one, is too many, I thousand never enough. When they take the first one, they want more and more, you cannot stop. Yeah, and you give them a monk to smoke or drink. But there are persons who get addictive. Now, addiction steps in only when you lose control. Eh? Because you see some people who have the jobs and everything, they still mm -hmm. smoking and drinking and still have the job and all that. Still but those who lose control over the, the, whatever the substance they use, and they lose control over it, the substance takes over your life. You used to live and you live to use. He was almost comfortable with it, as I will hear him say at times, because he was just going and coming, no big thing, mm -hmm. you know, mother shit, let's give him a time, let me go come back out and go and do the same thing again, yeah. you know, because some of them end up comfortable sleeping outside here, yeah? because as he will say, he will go by Salvation Army and get a suit of clothes. It's the same way he will go around the corner and get a plate of food or something to eat, yeah. free of charge, so it almost like he was a... A normal way to live. Way of life. Yeah. Of life. Yeah. Now, could this be a catch-22 here? Because you now we, we, we give people and they, they extend arms to these, these people, mm -hmm. clothes, food. Does that help the person to stay out there longer? It's a form of harm reduction too. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. harm reduction. Because we, are, we have a place, we both house has a place on Duncan Street mm -hmm. called the Oasis Drop-In Centre. Mm -hmm. Right. The person, homeless people access that facility. Mm -hmm. On a Monday and a Friday, you have almost 80 to 100 persons accessing that facility, homeless persons. Mm -hmm. About 60 or 70 percent of them are drug users, mm -hmm. right? During the week, you'll get 40 to 50 every day accessing the facility. Mm -hmm. They go there, they get a bath, change their clothes. Sometimes when the person in charge, they will observe them if they need medical attention, mm -hmm. give them a referral to go to the health office or whatever. Mm -hmm. If they see they need rehab, they ask if they want to go to rehab, they refer them to the report house. Okay. So it's a sort of um, uh, harm reduction. You just see the harm and you see some clean pipers walking the road. <laughs> <laughs> now, Michael reached very low, but that's not the end of his story. Let's hear now how Michael became clean. What had happened to my last time I get arrested? I done in the cell and said, because I had to take three months over my happy life, eh? because I had to go to prison. But then what I go do? It's real. So I go in front of the magistrate and plead guilty with intention to take three months off of this 
happy life, this insane happy life that I think was happy. But yet it's not happy, it's complete madness. So when I plead guilty, she said, let me see his convictions and they bring my conviction. And when she opened it and watched it, she's saying, but you have always been in and out of prison. And my answer to her is, your worship, is people like you have people like me in and out of prison. Because I'm an addict. When I come here, I ain't giving you no trouble, I plead in guilty. And what do you do? You send me to prison. So people like me will always have a lot of conviction, will always be in and out of prison. People like we need help, and you all doesn't help us. You all is learn people, and what you all does, send us to prison. So why is you saying, you're always in and out of prison. Why don't you send me to prison and let me come back out and live my happy life? She says, you see you, I'm going to help you. I would not send you to prison and I would not charge you. So I laugh because what makes me laugh? I say, but what she going to do? She says, I will help rehabilitate you. I say, well, that is what I want. She says, but where you live? I say, well, your worship, I really don't live nowhere, you know. I just sleep lies in South. I just sleep next to the police station because they have some lawyer's office there and you could sleep on the pavement. Why I choose to sleep there? In the night, it have these citizens who they say is good citizens that just come out and be the street dwellers. What they beating me for, I don't know. So I just sleep near the station. They don't beat you there because they're afraid of police. So I passed through this drunk treatment court for 18 months and praise God, I am one of the first graduates from the drug treatment court. I got a big certificate stating I'm drug free and I'm so proud about that life. Now when I watch back I realize I wasn't really happy. I had to be perfectly insane to be living that unhappy life and thinking that I'm happy. So right now I'm living in CSDP. And uh, what it is happening, it's nearer, I could do a lot of my courses more comfortable, but I'm still homeless. I am still homeless.